Hi, everyone. Welcome to Solar Ball Climate and Urban Health Workshop. My name is Maria Baxiarva. I am a postdoctoral scholar at UC Berkeley. I'm really upset that I couldn't be in Mexico City in person, but I'm sure that Josiah will do a great job representing the in-person part of our group, and he'll also be great at answering any questions you might have. So I'll start by introducing the historical and projected temperature data in Solar Bell, how it was derived, uh, et cetera. And then you'll tune in into this recorded presentation again in order to hear about analysis examples of effect modification of temperature related mortality by various city level factors. But first I'll start with the temperature data. So the historical temperature data in Solarval was originally derived from the ERA-5 land reanalysis data set, which is produced by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Now it is a reanalysis data set, meaning that it combines weather data from stations with model data. Now, weather observations usually come from a variety of sources, including meteorological stations and satellites, but they are not evenly distributed across the globe and they also vary in accuracy. And so combining uh, those uh, weather data obtained from satellites or weather stations with the model data actually results into comprehensive uh, variables describing the Earth's uh, weather. And the ERA-5 land reanalysis data set is a gridded data set available globally, so for the, for the entire globe at a spatial resolution of nine by nine kilometers. Now there are different types of climate variables and even temperature variables that are available from the ERA-5 land reanalysis, but a particular variable that we used is the two meter above surface level. So you can think of this as air temperature at two meters or ambient temperature. Now the ERA-5 land reanalysis is available from 1950 to present, and it is available originally at an hourly uh, temporal resolution. Now, this is the description of the uh, original data set. And of course we needed to subject it to a few processing steps in order to create exposure metrics for solar bell. So there were three main uh, processing steps and I'll go over each of them in detail. So the first one, the imputation for uh, coastal cities. The second one was population weighting of the imputed temperature data. And the final step was deriving the temperature time series for solar bell uh, spatial units. So the first step uh, involved imputation. And the reason we had to deal with it is because the ERA-5 land is a land component of the reanalysis and therefore it neglects uh, pixels with more than 50% water, which resulted into missing data in 98 coastal cities. And you can see the Peruvian city of Pisco as uh, one example here. So in order to ensure that our subsequent exposure metrics are not even partially based on data with missing values, we had to impute those missing pixels. And in order to um, undertake this uh, imputation procedure, we fit a random forest regression for every spatial unit in solar ball that had missing data. So for Every day and every spatial unit, uh, say be it L1UX, L1UD, or L2, we fit a random forest regression that consisted of the uh, era five temperature that did not have missing pixels and other terrain features such as absolute and relative elevation and aspect. And so after performing this uh, random forest regression, in order to um, impute the, the missing pixels, we obtained a uh, we obtained the gridded era five land data uh, product that didn't have any missing uh, pixels in the in those coastal cities. So overall, the imputation affected ninety eight cities, and among the cities that were affected, on average, ten percent of their area or ten percent of their temperature pixels were affected. Now, in order to ensure that our imputation um, was done correctly, we compared the imputed data to the weather data from stations, and that comparison re revealed a very high degree of agreement between the imputed data product and the um, actual observed weather from stations. And the second step 
um, involved weighting the imputed temperature data by the spatial population distribution in order to create more accurate measures of temperature exposure. And how it was done is that we use the population weights from the World Pop project. So those population weights represented um, 100 by 100 meter grid cells with estimated population counts for 2010. And we used the World Pop for all of the countries about Panama and Peru, for which we used global urban footprint because the World Pop estimates of uh, the spatial population distribution for these two countries weren't reliable. And so basically what we did in this population uh, weighting step is we combined the imputed gridded data with the gridded population data in order to create the population weighted temperature um, data. And then finally, using the imputed and population weighted temperature data, we extracted daily mean temperature for every day um, during 1996 through 2015 for L2, L1AD, and L1UX as an average of the era five land pixels. So the, it, this is an average of the population weighted and imputed pixels across each spatial unit. And we produced uh, both population weighted and unweighted uh, data for each spatial unit. And the final data, data set has a similar uh, form to the image below. So we have a, a spatial unit can be L1 uh, AD, L1 UX or L2. We have the date and then we have the population weighted uh, mean daily temperature for that city. And we also have the uh, unweighted mean daily temperature for that city as well. Now, I should also mention a few things about, um, about the advantages of using the reanalysis uh, data set such as ERA-5 land. So usually they have high temporal resolution. And in our case, the ERA-5 land had a nine by nine kilometer resolution. The, the, the reanalysis data sets usually also have global coverage and high temporal frequency. So the ERA-5 land in particular, in particular is available in close to near time. So this is particularly advantageous for deriving temperature exposure metrics to use in epidemiological analyses. Now these data are also usually temporally and spatially complete, although of course you need to be careful with, with the coasts and this completeness, the temporal and spatial completeness is present even in areas with sparse weather data. Now these um, exposure metrics derived from reanalysis data sets have been widely used in ecological, hydrological, and epidemiological research globally and uh, there's been a recent study that compared the temperature mortality uh, estimates using the era five land reanalysis temperature data and actual observed temperature data from weather stations. And it showed a very high degree of agreement and similarity between the temperature mortality curves using these two different temperature products. Now, there are also a few challenges and things to keep in mind when constructing um, temperature exposure met metrics from ERA-5 land and other reanalysis data sets. And the first one is that the quality of the reanalysis data is only as good as the input data. And for the input data, there are two components, the weather data and the computer weather model. So there are fewer weather observation stations as we go back in time. And you may remember that the ERA-5 land is originally available at hourly levels from 1950 to, to, to present, but it's really hard to go back further in time because there are fewer and fewer stations available before that. Now, of course, it's also worth remembering that the computer weather model is only a simplified representation of the real world and how the actual Earth atmosphere works. Now, another aspect that is particularly relevant for conceptualizing temperature exposure is the, is the aspect of the spatial representation of exposure measures. So in the reanalysis data set, we derive temperature from a nine by nine kilometer grid, 
um, as opposed to say using a point measure such as a weather station at an airport, for example. And because of that, the temperature values from the reanalysis are representative of the entire environment and of the entire landscape within that nine by nine kilometer grid, as opposed to just one single point. And of course, depending on um, how a researcher structures their analysis, this can have implications for um, for the bot potential biases and just the just the things to keep in mind um, about the resultant temperature exposure metrics. Uh, finally, there's also been a recent study that looked at the uh, era five land performance in uh, tropical regions, and it showed that uh, era five land may underestimate extremely high temperatures in tropical regions, and because of that. Uh, it's possible that these reanalysis products can also underestimate heat-related mortality in the tropical regions. So that, is, that part concludes the description of the historical data in Sauerbal, and now I'll talk about the future temperature data. One of the goals of Sauerbal is to estimate the future burden of temperature-related mortality for some point um, in the future, such as uh, the mid-century. And in order to do that, we would need to have the projected temperature data for that future time period. And in Solarball, our colleagues at UNC downscaled and bias-corrected a general circulation model to produce estimates of future daily temperature for Solarball cities. Now, this uh, downscaling and bias correction was done while well, taking into account uh, two different uh, concentration scenarios of the global um, greenhouse gases. In particular, our colleagues considered a representative concentration pathway 2.6, which is a very stringent scenario that requires that CO2 emissions start declining by 2020 and reach zero by the end of the century. The other scenario is RCP 8.5, and it is based on assumptions of increasing concentrations of CO2, which is in line with the current trajectory of the emissions. So using the global uh, circulation model and the two representative concentration pathways, our colleagues uh, downscaled the global circulation model from the global scale to Latin American region, and they also applied a bias correction technique to ensure that the projected temperature data preserve the trend observed in the historical data. Uh, the bias correction was, was based on a temperature offset computed based on the historical uh, time period, which spent 1996 through 2005. And at the end, the WRF uh, downscaled and bias corrected data was available at hourly steps separately for the Southern American region and for the Central American region for the mid-century time period of 2044 through 2054, as well as for that historical uh, time period. And after this uh, downscaling and bias correction was completed, uh, we needed to process this future temperature data in a similar way to how we process the era five land temperature data. So we population weighted the data and then computed several temperature variables. And the final product contains the uh, daily minimum temperature, daily maximum temperature, and daily mean temperature for every solar ball geography for the historical period, as well as for the two representative concentration pathways for the mid-century time period of uh, 2044 through 2054. The spatial and the temporal resolution of the future projected temperature is uh, the same as it was in the era five land. So namely the nine by nine kilometer spatial resolution and the daily temporal resolution was preserved. Thank you.